the undead permeate a significant portion of our pop culture. Fantasy, science fiction, horror, comedy, one could even argue that zombie movies constitute their own unique genre. Still, the vast majority of these IPs play around with only a couple aspects of the living dead, iterating on what came before without taking a long hard look at what it is they mean to implement. Since this series is all about hitting the proverbial snout of modern entertainment with the raw that newspaper of realism, it is high time we analyze what the shambling corpses of most settings are, how they behave and whether there are any fundamental world-bending issues surrounding their cold skin or brittle bones, except for ghosts. This is already an extensive topic and spectral entities are a beast of their own. While I'll bring up some ideas that are loosely connected to them, they are not going to be in the focus. Now, the video is going to be cut up into a few sections, as many under differ significantly. I do not only mean the discrepancies between a mummy and a vampire, but also between genres. For example, the existence of magic or the nature of a zombie outbreak may have enormous implications. However, a comprehensive assessment of what it means to be undead and what its real-life limitations would be is needed before we get into any of the genres. In general, undead are corpses that are either returned to a modified state of living or are animated by some sort of force or disease. The exact mechanics of how supposedly that tissue operates are seldom, if ever, discussed, despite the fact that this would be the most significant argument against the existence of such a state of unliving. Animals, including humans, are other complex constructs and as such require very specific conditions to be able to function. If these conditions are met and the various organs are allowed to operate, that's when living happens. Now, if the unliving thing in question has autonomy or is propelled by instinct, not controlled by a different entity or moved by separate implements, it pretty much requires cell body and the organs therein to do their job. Naturally, modern science has already proven that a person determined clinically dead can be brought back to life. Besides, with a clear understanding of what each organ does and what the exact operating environment and incentivizing cues are, almost any part of the body can be made to work again after death, given that it is fresh enough. One of the eerie experiments you could make is to just drop a heart in a jar of salted water and watch it start beating. An even more gruesome example is Prukonenko's decapitation experiment, where the severed head of a dog was reanimated using a heart-lung machine otherwise known as an autojector. Bio robots. Indeed, living things are practically biorobots with complex systems that ensure operating conditions are met. However, if these systems are broken down, most of them abandoned, and the body no longer exists as a whole, things get complicated. While looking at a person and seeing them move, it's easy to assume that that's just an innate simple function that could be resumed even after death. But if you want more than a couple of spasms, the body needs to have most of its functions operational. This pretty much rules out that this category of undead are actually dead. If motor functions are required, the body needs to be mostly alive. Mostly because some functions can be abandoned if the longevity of the shambling mass of flesh is not important. Now, breaking down every bodily function and deciding which exact ones are required is a very arduous task and, frankly, completely unnecessary. The point of all this is that your typical zombies or vampires would be actually alive, not just called husks. Although I have only said that almost any part of the body can be made to function again. Well, a big exception from this is the brain, which presents quite the issue. Even a relatively short amount of time spent under oxygen deprivation induces apoptosis, with significant damage occurring after around 3-6 to six minutes and usually leading to brain death above 10. This means one does not only lose cognitive function, but is also unable to maintain involuntary activity that is necessary to sustain life. This pretty much means one of two things is required. The reanimation has to take place rather swiftly, or the role of the brain has to be substituted with something else. Given that all of it happens swiftly, well, the resulting undead is just somehow brought back to life based on the previous criteria we established. This is doubly important because said brain has to be kept alive, which the body is pretty good at doing and there aren't many other ways to ensure its survival. Remember, only a few minutes without circulation result in significant damage. On the other hand, the brain replacement is a problem that can only be solved by fantasy or futuristic means, besides an incredibly complex surgery that usually leads to death anyway. These detractors make many traditional undead not only unfeasible, but impossible. 
What is that cannot act as if it was alive, not on its own? This is often solved with supernatural powers or technology, which are far more realistic solutions if they are established properly. However, this eliminates quite a good chunk of the living dead in popular culture. With these questions accounted for, this would be a good point to discuss Sundead by genre and type, beginning with modern time settings. These would mostly include zombie apocalypses or outbreaks, and let's sprinkle a significant portion of all vampire stories on the pile. I'm sure there are other minor variants, but these nicely encompass every trope I wish to discuss. So, the world's end induced by the dead spontaneously reanimating and spreading death. Now, about 99% of all zombie movies make little to no sense if you think about it. We are almost always presented with a war humanity has already lost, but it is seldom explored how this could even happen. The worst offenders are the likes of The Walking Dead, where zombies are slow, shambling creatures bereft of any intelligence. Human jaws and nails are pathetic weapons, and even if the dead reanimate, I find it hard to believe that any country would fall, let alone the world. Without speaking of military hardware like assault weapons or napalm, a bloody rake is enough to kill a horde of them. In many settings they are so pathetic that a sneaker to the head cracks their skull. Also biting is a very ineffective way to spread the generic disease these corpses carry. A not even particularly thick pullover would be all the armor you need. Unless the ENS is extremely virulent and kills rather swiftly, I don't see how 7 billion people on the planet would be overrun simultaneously. At that level of virulence though, the zombies are just flavor. A very unlikely flavor, but we'll get to that in a bit. As we've already discussed, based on the laws of nature, unless magic, aliens or technology is behind all of it, these zombies are not really undead, simply sick people. Being alive, they face even more hardships in their conquest of the world. Extreme temperatures, wildlife, hunger, thirst, other diseases, weather and many more factors would just kill them outright, let alone intelligent humans. A knife? No, a screwdriver wound is enough to kill one. If not by bleeding out, the infection will surely lead to death. This is the primary reason why something like The Last of Us would never ever never never ever never not under any circumstances ever never happen ever. Never ever. The fungus bullshit is just icing on the cake. In some settings, zombies also mutate, which is usually a rather questionable thing, but it does kind of address one issue. If the cause of the zombification would essentially create superhumans, that might be enough of an edge to beat the world. Bullet resistance, acid speed, extreme speed and natural weapons would be quite the addition. However, this is once again an aspect that requires supernatural or science fiction elements as none of it would ever happen naturally. Not with how genetics and diseases work. So we can see that traditional zombies would never take over the world. But what about unique cases or just small scale outbreaks? Surely there are ways to make it work. Indeed there are, but for that we need to take a look at how we could even make these mindless thralls a reality. The most common approach is a disease, usually a virus. Seldom implemented correctly, but if we stick to our already established alive zombies, there might be a few instances that can yield positive results. What we have to remember though is that regardless of whether we deal with a virus, bacterium or some sort of simple animal, the way they alter behavior is never intentional, not in the traditional sense of the way. These abilities usually start out as accidental side effects of their activity within the body. In some cases this altered behavior may present an advantage for the source of the illness. If it supports its spread or further weakens the host, reducing its resistances, this advantage will increase the success rate of said source. While the viruses are not even alive and have no autonomy, even they adhere to survival of the fittest in this way. Since this trait is an advantage, it will be more likely to appear in future generations and it will even have a chance to develop further through random mutations. Mutations in the biological sense, not the pop culture run. This could lead to a rather complex effect, including what we would call a typical zombie behavior. Loss of direction, extreme aggression, oppressed mental faculties. For this reason, many people cite rabies as the perfect candidate for the basis of a zombie virus. 
but there are other examples too. Toxoplasma gondii is a famous one, which eliminates rodents' fear of cats, even making them attracted to the smell of feline urine. This is due to the fact that the eukaryotic parasite can only sexually reproduce in cat hosts, therefore it is benefited by this side effect. Studies also found that they alter human psychology as well, promoting suicidal tendencies, but this is even more of an unintended consequence, as it is believed that the immune response of the human body is what really exerts this effect. Still, it is theoretically possible that random mutations would make future toxoplasma species make humans throw themselves in front of tigers. Yep. According to this study, they also infect tigers. Simple accidental side effects may occur even if they do not directly benefit the virus or organism, given that they don't hinder the spread either. However, these mutations happen over a long span of time naturally. Therefore, a sudden unexpected outbreak with such complex effects is rather unlikely. Humanity would almost definitely have at least some information on the pathogen already, and if it has such a strange, distinct consequence, one could argue that this is a hindrance. The very first cases would likely make headlines, people would be highly aware of it, likely developing cures way before any epidemic would get out of hand, unless it would be kept intentionally under wraps by an authoritarian government. Even then, for many of the reasons I've already stated, extreme virulence is the only way it could have any serious effect. Otherwise, the aforementioned small-scale disasters are the only adverse scenarios that are possible. Anyway, mind control is not something unicellular organisms or viruses would ever be capable of. The first obstacle is the sheer complexity of the human, or really any brain, compared to their own simplicity. Communication seems practically impossible, and none would have the capacity to dictate the decisions an animal has to make every second. We are talking about very simplistic beings. Viruses have no autonomy at all and pro or eukaryotes aren't built for this either. Now there might be a way that some complex symbiosis of many such entities work together and manage to hijack a body which would practically act according to a quasi-programming the system would be built around. However, this is not something that would ever occur naturally, so we are talking about bioengineering. Extremely complex bioengineering at that. The reason such needlessly complicated parasites would likely never develop is because it's not worth it. On this planet, the only things that matter are survival and reproduction. There are far easier ways to find a niche in which the pathogen can exist, and based on the sheer improbability and extreme number of intermediate forms that would not even benefit from the effects we are trying to achieve, this is an ultimately fruitless endeavor. Additionally, such a setup would only work on one specific species, maybe not even on every individual of that species, significantly narrowing down the effectiveness of the development. And what is the benefit anyway? This does not really help the spreading, not as much as simple irritation of the nose would do. It would be very clear for the happy individuals who is sick, and wobbling after them is not exactly peak virulence. Although there might be one advantage mind control provides, but not for these simple beings. Let's move on to animals. Without veering much into science fiction or fantasy, parasites that can control a human body could benefit from something rather unique, opposable thumbs. Indeed, if they would be intelligent themselves and use the infected humans to be their own society, that might be enough of a reason. It's an interesting premise, but one deeply flawed if we are talking about natural origins. In this case, not only do we need the extremely unlikely process of a parasite evolving a mechanism that allows it to connect to a human brain and control it to happen, we also need the parasite to be intelligent in the first place. First off, sentience is not something that is just handed out to any living creature. Being smart is a very energy demanding development and critical thinking is not a feature that would ever be necessary for a parasite of all things, or beneficial outside this exact scenario. This blend of circumstances make this one also effectively impossible without intelligent design. Now, some might bring up the Cordyceps fungus and how it was handled in The Last of Us. I've already tortured myself with analyzing that exact outbreak in a video, so trust me if I say that that's not a route we can take either. What that fungus does is more akin to the aforementioned toxoplasma infection, an influence on behavior, not an actual control of the mind. I'll cover engineering and magic in a bit, but let's keep focusing on other undead in current time settings. Vampires are a big one. There's a lot of variance between each, but most usually share the fact that they are dead, 
drink blood to sustain themselves, are more powerful than regular people, do not age and successfully remain hidden. Alright, buckle up folk, I'm gonna take a dump of practically every depiction of vampires. So we've already established that if they are capable of moving and thinking on their own, without constant use of arcane forces, they are very much alive, warm and a healthy color. I never understood why some people get aroused by the thought of fresh corpses, but they are out of luck. Is blood enough to sustain a grown human though? Now we have to assume that this is part of a curse, mental damage or the worst case of peer pressure, but naturally, if they are alive, they would crave regular food normally. If they drink nothing but blood, that's not enough. Something like a vampire bat or leech may be capable of living off of the sanguine liquid exclusively, but they've evolved to do so. A human body requires far more minerals and vitamins than those accessible through such means, and there is another far more important problem. Given the vampires generally drink the blood of other humans, which are biologically the same species, diseases transmitted through the red juice would infect them as well. Unless they have magical bullshit immunity, practically all vampires would fall victim to this, except I guess if they test their victims before every meal. Malnourished and disease-ridden are not the adjectives most likely with their vampire fantasies, but that would be their reality. Those are two nails in the coffin that can only be pulled out by the inclusion of magic. Here's the third. Superhuman strength. Usually part of the curse and therefore also an arcane feature. However, if the setting says that vampirism is a disease, trying to seem big boys who deal in realism and not that fantasy stuff that's so lame, well... I think I've gone on about how diseases usually work, but now we've got an illness that instead of working or reproducing and or feeding, would instead infuse someone with power. Also, this is practically only possible by inducing mutations, as is often the case. This is kind of a good way to segue back to a previous point I intentionally did not cover with zombies, especially infected. We once again need to take a long hard look at what parasites are and want to achieve. Sustenance and reproduction. You may argue that making the host stronger would not only ensure it has more time to feed and procreate, but more people would actually want to get infected. Well, imagine the incredible feat of evolving specifically to alter the DNA of a specific species. A specific species, mind you, that also evolves and changes its DNA as you try to affect it. Let's say you succeed, but now you must also, by chance, because you have no autonomy here, Find a recombination of the genes that does not kill the host, but makes it stronger, and is also in a code segment that is often copied and the body is rebuilt according to it. I hope I don't have to discuss how this idea is stupid any longer, but here's one more detractor just for the sake of it. You are a very simple organism. One extremely small that reproduces far more often than the host itself. As such, random mutations occur far more frequently. Emphasis on random. Say your prayers because it is almost guaranteed that something as delicate as a DNA rewriting ability is going to flip-flop and may lead to altering genetic code in such a way and such a place that it would kill the host or the ability that in some way killing you and everyone you know. Also, pop culture has this weird idea that living things have one strand of DNA within them and rewriting it causes immediate changes. DNA is incredibly ubiquitous in a single creature and there is no master strand to alter. Every single cell has its own DNA to copy and the amount of simultaneous restructuring that would have to take place for the typical video game mutations to occur is beyond improbable. Also matter doesn't just spontaneously materialize itself, I'm looking at you Resident Evil. Have any of your writers ever heard of the principle of mass conservation? Bloody hell. Alright, two more things remaining for vampires. One is eternal youth, but that can be attributed to how they are practically perceived as conserved corpses. Naturally, something only possible through magic. The other thing is not related to anything scientific really, it's just a bad trope. Hidden vampire cabals. With how much killing most of them do, the suspiciousness of eternal youth, Outright gang wars, entire societies sustained by seas of blood, and somehow every single vampire being of the opinion that they should indeed be kept a secret, it's flat out immersion breaking. As with most things of this nature, there is no way in hell they could remain hidden for millennia, that there wouldn't be a single fuck up, or a vampire that would rather be cured and seek help. 
Also, some of them go to high school and tell any girl they fancy all about vampires. Nah, -uh. unless this phenomenon is extremely rare, with only a couple isolated cases throughout history, which also eliminates vampires' ability to turn people, because you can bet your ass that at least one of them would abuse that, they are not going to be unknown. These limitations should be taken into account when one deals with vampire fiction. Making them biologically sound and realistic is a futile attempt. Their usual characteristics force supernatural elements into the mix. Also, any setting that is modern times exactly like our own world, but secretly there was magical bullshit going on throughout history, has fundamentally already failed world building, and how everything is based on cause and effect. No way such a significant factor would not have affected the globe and human society. Part of the reason Harry Potter makes me vomit. That and poker slavery. That's enough of contemporary settings, I think. Let's move on to more far-fetched pastures that allow for far more freedom. Science fiction in our case means two things, incredible technology and alien life forms. Technology is rather self-explanatory and has quite a few neat ways on that do not break the verisimilitude of the story. Well, quasi-undead. Robotic extensions and mind controlling machines can affect the living, making them zombie like but not truly undead. People that are no longer themselves, piloted remotely or with an AI. Not perfect, but a start. If a brain is kept alive in a jar some way, it can be augmented with an artificial body. Or if a consciousness can be simply digitalized, a completely synthetic body can be given to countless copies of the same person even. This highlights one problem though, there's no real need for human flesh, apart from the aforementioned brain in some cases. Once we move on to futuristic settings, the pathetic nature of human physique becomes apparent. When alive, it's useful, but once dead, it has no further use. Anything mechanical is superior, unless the flesh is genetically modified to incredible degrees, but at that point we aren't really talking about undead anyway, just superhumans and monsters. I have no idea how much of it was intentional and how much of it was coincidence, but Necrons from 40k are possibly the best form of true undead. The digital consciousness and memories of a once living being confined to an artificial body. Are organic zombies possible in a futuristic setting though? The genetic engineering opens up a lot of possibilities. With intelligent design we can bypass the need for a sound evolution. Could an advanced society create the disease that would make the undead we want? Well, yes, but no. With this approach, we once again have to adhere to the living rule. At best, this would be a form of mind control. Still rather potent, but not necessarily for the reason most settings present. Say we have a unicellular organism or an animal parasite larvae that can be dispatched mixed with a gaseous medium. This ensures a rapid spread and that anyone without an effective mask would be infected. Now since we are talking about actual beings, the effects would not be immediate. It could take hours, days or even longer, especially in the case of more complex parasites. If engineered perfectly though, they could render the victim an aggressive shell of their former self lashing out at anything, potentially capable of using tools and weapons, but in this case, even unarmed victims might be enough due to secondary effects. The difficulty would be in ensuring they do not kill each other. The main benefit is that not only does this present a ticking time bomb, people who will undoubtedly become brain dead, not literally, but you get the point, but instead of only presenting a simple issue of body disposal, the quasi-zombies are still living people who have to be put down. The demoralization and utter chaos might very well be just the tactical edge the user of the weapon needs. Sure, an atomic bomb or equivalent would also be quite affected, but this bioweapon may have a tactical use in some niche scenarios. Not something to be used on territories you'd want to conquer though. We still have at least one more possibility as well. This would entail a more complex organism, some form of animal, either alien or bioengineered. This creature would in some way find its way into the body of a host. There it begins to grow and consume. Through this process it would likely absorb the victim in its entirety and may have the capacity to utilize some of its genetic code. Now genetic code utilization is not something that would likely develop on its own but a readily available form of genetic manipulation that is a side effect of another evolutionary feature is an option. However, this act would require not only sentience, but a high level of intelligence. 
Some settings kind of have this natural fusing of the parasite to the host, but I refrain from doing that unless that particular parasite is also certified by an engineer, ensuring that something akin to a transplant rejection does not occur and that two vastly different creatures are seamlessly incorporated is an incredible feat of its own. Definitely not something a mindless grunt can do, unless it was programmed to by its creators. Then again, it would likely have to be recreated for every different species. Regardless, fused monsters are somewhat of a possibility with the right background, and such a creature would have every right to be called an undead. It used to be a person once that died somewhere along the way. Transitionary stages would probably be quite terrifying. Although, as I've already said, it would be very unlikely for an alien creature to evolve in this way, as it would still face the same problems on its home planet that we've already established. There is at least one more option. Let's have the host remain alive, but give the parasite the capacity to sever key neurological connections and overtake them. Still something much more befitting of an intentionally designed animal, especially since this would also need a level of intelligence similar to that of the host to be able to control them, and would similarly need to be created on a case-by-case -case basis, if it is itself not smart enough to adapt to any design. So is there any naturally formed alien that would realistically be capable of forming a zombie? Well, I don't think so, not anything that is meaningfully different from what could potentially develop on this world, especially since it would have to work on humans, requiring it to be evolved to survive under terrestrial conditions or those found within the body. The thing is, truly dead zombies are only a viable option in fantasy or settings with some form of magic, so let's move on to that section. Now the arcane elements of the myriad worlds human minds have created are extremely varied in function, method and source. As such, every scenario is different, but there are a few guideways we can follow. First off, let's see why necromancy is useful. Every benefit of it, not just military, as those are often the only ones considered. Life is rather ubiquitous, and almost everything is destined to die. The few exceptions aren't really important anyway. Now, throughout life, creatures develop, well, themselves. They build some sort of shell or skeleton, grow muscles, all sorts of useful stuff. Similarly to how we can use bones or ivory to create tools, necromancy uses these remains in their entirety to form useful implements. The main benefit of the black arts is that everything is pre-crafted, and these are pretty fine crafts as well. Not only are they incredibly complex, but evolution has ensured that they all have some strengths. The added bonus of necromancy is that something that dies can still resume the task it performed before the incident, in most cases. Raising the dead is an endless source of workforce. Any society that would use these powers would become an economic powerhouse, untiring slaves with presumably minimal upkeep and no desires assembling, cleaning, harvesting or standing guard day in and day out. Dead cows to pull the plows, desiccated hounds to keep watch, rotting birds to break the besieged with the spread of disease. An incredible tool to be used, but often a double-edged blade. First off, most sentient species would likely have a problem with essentially desecrating the dead, knowing that your body will never know peace as the state requires its service. A religious drive or a pretty high level of enlightenment bereft of traditional morality are factors that could allow for its acceptance in some societies, but I wouldn't see it being a widespread thing early on in history. Even more so, since nations that would oppose the dark arts would likely join forces to eliminate those who employ them. The war could go either way though, as any battle that results in the necromancers winning would only bolster their forces. But this is common knowledge at this point. Another difficulty with standardized use of Walking Dead is rotting. In case there are no ways to perpetually conserve the meat, or the method itself is very resource consuming, it would present a problem. However, if there is no need for the muscles themselves to move the undead or any fleshy bits for some purpose, skeletons are the perfect solutions. I'd say that it should be standard procedure to clean the bones before reanimation for any corpse that is to be used among the population. Zombies should rather be makeshift soldiers at the most, or ones specifically created to infect the enemy with something nasty. I haven't talked much about skeletons until now, but that's because there are no muscles to move them, so supernatural forces are the only things that can make them real. Those and mechanical parts, but I don't see any use for them in a futuristic setting besides symbolism. 
or magic. Unfortunately, with this clarification, I ruined my chance for a perfect segue. Oh well. You might have noticed anyway that I kept talking about societies that use necromancy as living ones. That was intentional, as I see those as way more realistic than the usual tropes. Hear me out. Usually, factions that use undead are almost exclusively undead themselves, either controlled by vampires, liches, or some other intelligent corpses. I'd say those are pretty flawed nations. First off, natural replenishment of your troops and workforce is not so. It is pretty difficult to cultivate more and more power if you have to actually attack and raid other nations to gather any reinforcements. Second, replenishment of high-ranking officers, meaning undead that are sentient, is even more troublesome. You'd have to rely on random, trustworthy, capable people deciding to join you. Not really an effective method, I'd say. It would similarly be hard to garner any sort of sympathy from the living anyway. Indiscriminate murder for the sake of securing slaves is not going to earn you many fans. I dislike the fact how every faction that dabbles in necromancy is immediately labeled as evil in media, as there might be good reasons to utilize the dead, an act that is not inherently malevolent, but these unnecessary limitations forced onto such factions do make it hard to present them as sympathetic. To present a strong argument, let's see how a living population would benefit their position. First off, replenishment is solved. Second, they would have a much better time with diplomatic relations. Third, diversified military and workforce. Complex tasks and intricate implements are not things that could just be given to mindless corpse and yield good results. Living people, on the other hand, need only a bit of education. Additionally, I'd say it presents a lot more interesting cultural interactions, but this is far too subjective of a thought to be considered a pro. There are some objective cons though, resources and commodities. Living beings require far more. Food, housing, entertainment and rest are some of the most important. Granted, I do believe that their bodies alone would be a return on investment, let alone the potential work they perform throughout their lives. The real difficulties we've already solved when we start discussing the currency, namely disease and morality. I'd say benefits far outweigh any potential costs. However, if you intend to make a faction with purely undead, do keep the drawbacks in mind. Concerning the act of necromancy, there is one more thing we can discuss, which is more of a prompt for interesting storytelling than rule of its own. If magic works in a way that a spell is used to simply move the dead and give them a basic programming, for lack of a better word, so no spirit binding and sentient forces in play, what is the difference between it and making golems or automatons? The raw material. If anything, necromancy would need less work as the perfect subject is readily available. Naturally, the morality factor would be the real decider, but given the connection, this gives way to very interesting cultural conflict. It would be safe to assume that association with the dark arts, even if you use artificial bodies, is not too desirable. The public eye could shun golem makers, which could easily result in bans, debates, riots, and wars even. Quite a volatile set of circumstances ripe for political intrigue. That's the magic itself explored, but fantasy also changes the rules for some of the undead we have already discussed. Liches are practically the arcane equivalent of necrons. As such, making them should be incredibly difficult, and they should rather not be able to resist being killed. With truly immortal beings come many problems that need to be accounted for, which is a rabbit hole I myself would not go down. With a way for said immortality, one that has been discovered, mind you, there'd be quite a list of people undertaking the ritual or spell. With a loss of consequences, seeing that they can no longer die, many would likely to turn out to be monsters. As time goes on, the proportion of these beings would rapidly accelerate if there is no way to permanently get rid of them. Even if the technique is forbidden, the documents burned, it can always be rediscovered. It's a self-inducing cascade of clusterfuck, but few writers see this issue for what it is, and such events usually do not transpire, with extremely powerful beings just sitting around and doing stuff for decades or centuries at a time so that the main plot can ignore them until a great villain is needed. The other beings fantasy authors are vampires. With magic there are a lot more ways to make them true to the trope. Blood for sustenance, transforming into a bed, being truly dead, those are all fine. Well, transforming I have an issue with but that deserves its own video and this is already quite packed. 
Kebabs are also more likely, as vampires are usually a known adversary, constantly pursued, and technology is far less developed to identify them long term. Well, in all, much more realistic in fantasy, as uh, weird as the sentence is. Do make them magical though, as there is no sound biological explanation. With this, we only have one last undead type to cover, which is sort of fantasy, but can appear in horror or science fiction just as well. It only aspects with dark gods, eldritch entities, unfathomable evil, or something of the sort. This one I'd be very careful with. A powerful being that can control the dead is a world-ending threat and requires severe limitations. If its power can only be exerted through its disciples or the undead servants are temporary, it can work. However, a being that can turn anyone at a whim would have either conquered the entire world several times over before humans ever had a chance to tie rocks to sticks, or it views the world as its plaything. It is unnecessary to discuss mechanics here, as the entity's methods for raising the dead would fall under one of the categories we've already talked about. The main thing to keep in mind here is to always keep power levels in check. While it is primarily a video game term, power creep is becoming more and more prevalent with stories. It is always important to perform a thought experiment with what certain abilities will allow someone or something to do, and why they do or don't do it. This is pretty generic advice though, not specific to Undead. That's because I have said my piece. There might be some bits I have not mentioned, but these were the ideas and crabs I wanted to present in video form. If you fancy yourself a world builder or just like to discuss stories, monsters or media, I'd invite you to join my Discord server through a link in the description. Either way, I thank you for listening this long and hope to see you next time. Bye!